You ready? Yeah, we're going. I'm ready. Welcome to Tulsa Uncut. I'm Laurie. This is the one and only Trip Pollard with PMC. And I guess I introduced myself. My name is the Mechanaka with Tulsa. With Tulsa. <laughs> with Tulsa. And Mecca, thank you for being here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your journey. Um, how did, how, who is Mecca? Okay. So I was to share a little bit why I said I am here with Tulsa because I am not even a native Tulsan. Um, I'm from Georgia by way of DC and Nigeria. And to make a long story short, born in DC, raised in Georgia, lived in Nigeria for a little bit, but I moved to Tulsa when I was 18 to go to school. And um, I had no expectation of staying here, but I moved here for college. Um, I was not good at school, uh, ended up uh, trying out for us in my pro team. Um, unfortunately for me, I broke my neck in a football game and had to like really start my life over. And Tulsa really embraced me and they picked me back up and that's why I say I'm here for Tulsa. Really? Wow. wow. So what happened that day? So we were playing a game in Arkansas, I went down to make a tackle and uh, man, it's a play I've made a hundred times before. I went, made the tackle and I just couldn't get back up and ambulance came, they rushed me to the hospital. That's where they informed me that I had broken my neck and so began this journey of adversity. Yeah. So. Jesus. You know, we have a lot of, my son is a football player, you know, and so it's always that thing that you, you worry about. So when, when you are accustomed, you're, you're on the field, you're an athlete, and then this happens, I'm sure that there was a lot of mental everything, oh, right? Yeah. It, what's interesting is that people will look at my life and they think that, it was a like that I'm dealing with a physical um, issue and they don't understand that it was a physical, emotional, spiritual, social. Like, I feel like I was tested in every aspect of life. And um, that was very hard because mentally it was like, OK, physical, the physical part, I can, I'm going to therapy. Um, the mental part is like, yo, am I end this by myself. Mm -hmm. uh, can I do this? Who am I? Um, it was rough. It, it, it was rough. Um, but fortunately for me, I had people in my corner that lifted me up when I wanted to give up. Yeah. Yeah. I'd imagine that spurred on just an identity crisis pretty Absolutely. much like immediately. Oh, you know, like I can't imagine like if, if you're all in on football, like that's who you are. And then just a flip of switch. Man, I cannot imagine. To have my life change in the drop of a like flip of a switch. Yeah. Just everything changed. I had to look myself in the mirror and ask myself, who am I? And I didn't know who I was early in the early in my journey because I associated my identity with football. Um I associated my identity with the things that I was doing, but not the person that I was being. Um, and after my injury, that is when I got tested to like, really find out like, yo, who do you want to be? Like, mm -hmm. are you going to serve yourself, um, serve the world? Uh, and so I actually, I started volunteering with the youth group and, uh, working with kids. And that's when the switch for me happened. Sorry, You're okay. That's him making another switch. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, hey, I'm, 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 I'm on the don. So what did that what did that do for you? Because you say that you went and volunteered, you started helping kids. What did that start unlocking? Because I assume it's it's piece by piece. This version of you begin to unlock itself. You know, you begin to find these different pieces of you. So the interesting thing was like, you know, I start, I start serving, I start volunteering. And what was great for me was that I took, it took the attention that I was giving to myself. Like, who am I? What am I going to do? And I just got to pour that energy into other people, kids, you know? And I think that is the hardest part sometimes about life is that we, it's not the, it's not the failures that like really doom us. It's like our expectations of what we think life is supposed to be, That's you know? Right. And so the reality versus our expectations that incongruency sometimes is what really gets us. And so I had to really let go of expectations. You know, 
I was 21 years old, uh, 21, 22. And I was like, you know, my, this is not the life that I planned out for myself. And I'm sitting here holding on to this life that I think I'm supposed to live. Yeah. And it is excruciatingly painful to wake up and be in this reality of like, yo, this is not right. what you have, right. you know? And so it wasn't until I was able to like really embrace where I was. Yeah. Um, and then I could start to plan, okay, all right, let's reset. This is where I am now. Where do I want to go? Yeah. So, you know, I think it's, it's, you use the word expectation. I was literally just having this conversation the other day. So oftentimes people place expectation, whether it be on themselves or other people. And expectation is really like the segue into disappointment most times because your expectations are set so high or unrealistically that it opens that floodgate right open for disappointment discouragement, frustration. Mm -hmm. And so you find yourself in, in the situation. It is what it is. So now what, what is the now what, how did that unfold? So even speaking about the expectation with friendships, yeah, that was, I think that was the hardest part of my journey was like these relational, these relationships that I thought would be there to support me. You know, it was hard having people like leave my life. Yeah, Like that was harder than anything. You know, because I had friends that I had been there for in our hardest moments. Like mm -hmm. I had friends that I've introduced them to their wives, friends that I had been there for. And then now here I am in this moment and they could not reciprocate that for me. And, and you know, now that I'm removed from it, I can look back and see like, okay, that's, that's okay because they didn't have the capacity and plus life ultimately does that for us where it's kind of the sifter. And so the people that are supposed to be around are, they get, they get, you know, shaken off and that's fine. Like that's, we all go through something that tests the relationships around us, but it is, whew, it is hard losing people because it is. again, we all had breakups, but breaking up with friends and oh, colleagues and just, that is so deep and, that was probably the hardest part of like my recovery was like, yo, I got to understand that. Like it's okay, but it hurts. <laughs> it hurts. It does. It hurt. hurts because you love these people and you love with such a genuine, authentic love. And when it really mattered for you, who was there in your corner and no fault, I mean, no blame the circumstances. It is what it is, but it doesn't mean that it still didn't hurt. You know, yeah. I get that. So you begin this journey because rumor has it that you do motivational speaking. I think those rumors would be very correct. <laughs> so <laughs> how, how did that start for you? So I went to, so it's great when I go back to that time after my injury, it was like triple darkness. You know, I don't know what I don't know what I don't know. Like I, you know, I'm 21 years old. I'm not prepared to live a life with disability. Who knows? I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And in the darkest part of that was the question of, does my life matter? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and since I've worked with kids for as long as I've worked with, that's a question that I think a lot of people ask. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't reach the answer of like, yes, it does, you know, uh, and even me at that moment, like wondering, like, does my life even matter? And there were a couple of days where it felt like it didn't. Mm -hmm. um, I'll never forget the day that I wake up and I go to sleep and there was no notification on my phone. Not a text, Damn. not a call, not a Facebook notification. Uh, and I'm experiencing all this pain from like my body and just everything in this moment has become heavy and real. And it's like, I have no one to reach out to. And it was that, you know, at that moment when I have to ask, answer that question, does my life even matter? Yeah. At that moment, the answer was like, no, like I've dropped off the face of the earth. Yeah. Right? 
to give you some context, you know, when I got out of the, when I came back to Tulsa, so my game was in Arkansas. When I came back to Tulsa, it's my my injury news has hit the Channel Six, Channel Eight, all the different mm-hmm. you know, outlets. So I've got a lot of attention on me in the hospital. And then after three months, um, people's people got to go back to what they're doing. You know, mm-hmm. my sisters, my dad, my friends, like. People got to go back to work. People got to go back to school. And it feels like I'm stuck on stop. Like I'm just yeah. watching everyone's life like Continue unfold forward, while yeah. mine is like feeling like it's going backwards. Right. So now here I am asking, you know, answering this question like, yo, so my life doesn't mean anything. Um, no one sees me anymore. Um, everything that, you know, was everything that I've worked for up until that point is like gone. And, you know, it's, it's like the hope is just fading. Uh, and I tell people that when I was in the hospital, there was an expectation that I had that once I got out of the hospital, that I was just going to go back and pick up my life. Mm-hmm. So I placed this life that I was so excited to live, so happy to experience and and just so feeling like I'm so lucky that this is my life. I put that life on the shelf with every expectation, speaking of expectation, expectation that when I get out of the hospital, I am going to go and pick up this life and I got to go back and do the thing that I love doing. Yeah. You know? And when I get out of the hospital, uh, things become a lot more realer because when I'm in the hospital, there's doctors on call, there's nurses on call, there's all the support, you know, yeah. even though, granted it's not support from like friends and personal family. Friend, yeah. yeah, It's not personal, yeah. but it is support. You know, if I'm in pain, I can push a button and someone comes right. and gets me medicine. But now I'm outside of the hospital and it's rough. It's me and my dad. It's me, myself, and I. It's like, so here I am with this expectation I'm going to go back to my life. And after about three months, it's slowly starting to creep in that, yo, this life that I was living ha- is expiring before my very eyes. Yeah. Like, I yeah. am not Nothing going back to it. Nothing was the same and is not going to be like, I am not going back to football. Yeah. Uh, that was extremely like difficult to navigate because you know at that point it's like now when you talk about the identity crisis there was at least a little bit of hope that i had that like once i got to the hospital i'd go back to my things yeah. now that hope is starting to f- like slowly fade away um and then what ended up happening how i got involved in what i was doing was like so a friend of mine would come by to my house and we would watch Monday Night Football. He knew, would you mind opening this water for me? Take a little sip of here. We're good. We're good. If you need a drink, I'll just I'll just do it. Appreciate it. <laughs> so my this guy comes over and he is asking me, you know, hey, you know, let's watch football together. Mm-hmm. Even at that time, I was so starved for connection that of course I want to do it, you know. And I love. Let me say this: I love football. I love watching the game. I love playing fantasy football. Fantasy football. Uh, I love all aspects of football. It was hard to watch football. Say, was it like torture? You're like, hell no, I don't want to watch that. Hell to the no, I don't right now. There were a lot of things that were hard in that moment because it was just, I'm raw, I'm exposed. Yeah. So, But the pain of, like that pain wasn't greater than the pain of feeling like alone. You have no one, yeah. Yeah. So we're watching football, you know, and I'm still enjoying it. So then our 
group kind of turns a little bit bigger because he's inviting people from work. And he was working at a youth group. Uh, he knew that I liked kids. He knew that I was good with kids. And so he invites me to come join him at work. They're like, just come hang out at work. So I'm like, you know what? I, all I'm doing is going from home to rehab and back re, rehab back home. I've got no sidewalks in my house. I can't get out of my house and go do anything. So yeah, why not? I'm going to ride the bus and go see him at work. And I had no idea that saying yes to this would be end up being something that changed my life because I get there, I show up for one day. Um, I still don't feel in place because <laughs> to be honest with the people, I, at the time, I'm very rugged. I'm a very... For where we were at, I didn't fit in. You know, yeah. my actions, my what I did didn't fit in with like the kids that I'm working with. You know, and so I didn't feel like <laughs> I had anything to offer. You know, um, but I had one conversation there where this kid was like asking me a bunch of questions, and I got to share you know just about life, and they are soaking in what I'm saying, and it was all just from like life experience, and so I went home feeling like know what maybe my life is not over maybe there is something more to give and I just had to realize that it was at the benefit of other people because so I like to say that you know when we can find purpose in pain um, then we can like really do some things with our life and the thing is that the question that I have to ask her that we ought to ask is like will you Continue to march on if you can find purpose in your pain, even if that purpose is not for yourself. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. you know, for me, it's like, okay, well, I feel I found a new purpose in like serving other people. Can that drive me to, you know, push past the pain that I'm in? Yeah. Uh, if I don't, if I don't feel like I'm going to get anything back, can you say yes? Can you answer that call? And uh, by God, I, I felt that uh, I felt very energized to be around these young people that I got to talk to. I got to work with. Um, it gave me a new passion. It gave me uh, it gave me a, a new will to like get up in the morning. Yeah. And so I would go by this youth group every day. I was going there and I was going to my gym and I would be at the gym working out. And at this place, it's called the Center for Individuals with Physical Challenges. I was working out on these machines um, and at this building, no one looked at me as a person in a wheelchair because everyone had their own stuff. Sure. And so I can go there, I can work out. They're looking at me and they just see Mecca. And I, at that time, couldn't see me. Like I just, all I saw was a chair. Um, and so here I am where they are seeing me for me. And now I'm going to this youth group where I have to kind of practice like, okay, I am me. Like, I'm not just a guy in a wheelchair. Right. <laughs> but it was hard because working with kids is... They say the darndest things. Okay. <laughs> so let me tell you. Kids don't care about how you feel when they are curious. Yeah. yeah. Right. I wear, I use a big wheelchair. Um, <laughs> kids will ask every single question that they mm -hmm. have and I feel like that was something that tested me early because <laughs> kids ask the hard questions and so when I would leave there I would have to answer these hard questions for myself um, these kids would ask questions like so you know what is that thing um, why did you end up in that thing I'm trying to tell them about football I'm trying to tell them about breaking my neck um do you regret it? Um, do you like your life? What wow. are you going to do with your life? Um, they say in the you know in in the Bible they say out of the mouth of babes, and so God was just like convicting you. So you're welcome. <laughs> I um, wow. one of my favorite Michelangelo quotes. One of my quotes. One of, one of my favorite quotes is by Michelangelo, the artist and sculptor. Mm -hmm. Someone asked him. Um, in regard, it was after he had created this like sculpture, and someone asked him, like, hey, like, how do you create these masterpieces out of a block of stone? And Michelangelo's response was like, in every block of stone, there is a masterpiece. 
my only job is to knock off the excess stone. Mm. So in reading that, I just felt like, you know, everyone's life has like a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. You just have to knock off the excess stone. And so what these kids were doing with every hard question is like chipping away. Yeah. Excess stone. And if you've ever seen anyone sculpt something and they have a chisel and they're hitting it with this hammer, mm -hmm. there is sparks. Uh, it is not a pleasant process. It is. It looks like it hurts. If that stone could, could feel, it is. It looks like it hurts. Yeah. And, but at the end of it, we get this smooth, uh, beautiful thing that we can look at. And at the end of it, we admire what it is in front of us. But do we acknowledge what it took to get there? You know? Mm -hmm. And so here I am getting this excess stone knocked off. And at that moment, it, it was painful. But I got to a point where I could look back and I'm like, oh, yo, hey. There's something that is being created right now that yeah. I am a part of. These kids are a part of, and I'm on board. Like it's gonna hurt, but I'm on, bo I'm on board. And I start to talk. Um, and to be honest, it was kids that really sent me down my path. Like I'm a therapist now. I work with kids. It was them that asked me originally, like, "Hey, have you ever thought about speaking? Have you ever thought about counseling?" Wow. Wow. And no, I never did. But since you believe in me, why not? Yeah. You had to just that. completely reorient your compass. You know? Absolutely. Before it was like football, future football, and then reoriented. But you probably needed some help to get there. And why not some kids that will drill you? <laughs> Even to this day, I enjoy working with young people because they see the world in such a way that it is like... An innocent way. It's an innocent way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like it's limitless hurt. almost to them. They don't see that, you know, we get tainted as adults. You know, we, we see all the things that we see, but kids, they have like an infinite belief in the unbelievable. Yeah. So the, in the possibility, you know, yeah. and, uh, I just, then again, they they saw something in me that I could not see for myself yet. Um, and then once, you know, time unfolds and it's like, you know, you just show up. And I think that, when I talk to people and I talk about just about life, there's such an underrated factor for showing up. You know, you never know what will happen, but nothing can happen if you don't show up. Right. And so just saying yes to my life after having every reason to say no, um, changed everything because I started serving there. Um, I spent, Three, I spent four years serving at this youth group. Um, and in that four year span, I went from just being in the back, just listening and talking to whoever would come up to me, to leading a small group, uh, to being on stage talking to, you know, hundreds of kids at a time, to ultimately watching kids that were in my first cohort go off to college. Wow. And then come back and tell me, Yo, Mr. Mecca, I'm so glad that you got hurt. Like there, <laughs> let me tell you, there is a story because these two kids, these two boys, uh, and I always say their names because I never, never they're gonna see them, but Jason Peterson, Chris Holmes. Um, they were a couple of like uh, sophomores whenever I first met them. And I watched them grow up. They go off to college. Um, they come back, both of them came back, you know, same weekend. I remember we we're outside talking, we're watching these kids play basketball at this youth group. And one of them says to me, oh, Mr. Mack, I'm so glad you got hurt. Makes me look at them like, what? I'm like, oh man, they came out wrong. I, what we mean to say is that we're so glad that like life brought you into our path because we talk about it and we wouldn't be the men that we are today without your oh. leadership. Damn. And... I can tell you, it's a, it was a Wednesday night. At that time, I'm riding on a bus back home. And I tell you, that comment changed everything. Um, because it was that moment that I realized that my life was not my own. Um, I realized that there was purpose in my pain. Absolutely. Um, and from that moment is when I decided that, you know what? Whatever it is that I go through, I can find a way to recycle it and make sure that it's not, pain is not in vain, you know? And so I 
kept serving on the kids and watching them. So that's the craziest thing is that watching them graduate college inspired me to go back to college because <laughs> at that time yeah. I was very, I was on academic probation. I wasn't good <laughs> at school y'all. Like I had a lot of F's and going to graduations was something that I still did because I had friends that were graduating mm -hmm. and it did something to watch people that I went to school with graduate people that were under me graduate and then watching kids that I basically raised graduate. Mm -hmm. And it was like, yo, I'm going to need to graduate. I think I got to <laughs> go back to school. Like, and a school kind of found me and it was a perfect match with Langston. And I then, love Langston university. Yeah. They're there, such a good school. There was another moment to change everything. Like a professor reached out. Like I reached out to the professor. We had a meeting cause he, I was reaching out to him to speak at a symposium that he was hosting. I was a little bit too late due to my own procrastination. But right before I was leaving this meeting, he asked me a question that would change everything. He said, hey, what plans do you have for school? And I was like, hey, man, I don't, you don't know this about me, but me and school, we don't really mix like that. <laughs> and he was like, hey, I would love to scholarship you to come and be a part of our program. We, I feel like you have a lot to offer. And How can you say no? How right? can I say no? I talk about hope a lot. And the tenets of hope are having goals, having pathways to attain those goals, and then having um, a sense of agency that you can do it, a belief in yourself that you can overcome obstacles to get to your goals. When all three of those things are clicking, you are a person that is high on hope. You subtract just one of those things and you'll be a person low on hope. So if you have a goal, but you have no way to get to that goal, you can lose belief in yourself very easy. Um, for example, you know, when you're a 21 year old athlete with a goal of playing professionally and lifting your family out of circumstances and providing and being a light, what happens when that pathway of being on the football team and you break your neck on the football field, what happens? You lose hope. Um, and here, and also with pathways, you know, have you ever heard of where there's a will, there's a way? We all know that saying, you know? Mm -hmm. So if I am going to get on the other side of this door, I am very, motivated to either go through it, under it, around it, whatever it takes. That is willpower, okay? And not everyone has willpower to, you know, go through certain things. But there is on the flip side of that, there is something called way power. So like I said, where there's a will, there's a way. Where there's a way, there can be a will. And so I had no real willpower to do whatever it takes to go back to school. Academia was not my friend. Mm -hmm. But when this professor, you know, Made opens the, the door, way, yeah. you know, removes a barrier, like, hey, yeah. I will scholarship you. We want you. You know, I may not have had enough will to break down a door, but with the door being open for me, I had just enough will to walk through it. Mm -hmm. And that changed everything. So I went, I was like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to do it. And went back to school. Uh, took me three years to finally get that undergrad degree because at this point I'm seven years into my college collegiate journey. And like I said, the kids really inspired me to be a counselor. So I was like, all right, to be a counselor, I guess I got to go back to, I got to go to school again and get my master's degree. Now, when I decided that I was going to go get my master's degree, I'm having an internal dialogue with myself. <laughs> um, it is the old me, the current me, and the future me that are all having this conversation in my head. Current me is saying, like, hey, I think we're going to go do this. Future me is saying, yeah, you should do this because it's going to benefit us. Old me is like, boy, shut up. You are not <laughs> going to go do college and do a master's degree. And I'm having this dialogue, yeah, trying, yeah. Yeah, just trying to figure out, like, yo, is, is the old me going to win out in this battle between, you know, old me and new me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And really, everybody wakes up with these competing factors is old me you know I, i've decided that i'm going to be this in my life i'm decided that i'm no longer going to do xyz but some days old me wins um and some days new me wins and you, you just have to make sure that new me wins more than old me hearing you describe it i literally like envision your mind being a football field and it is literally like you're out there and you're like, okay, here's my strategy. Yes, we are going to win this. We're going to do this. We going to, I've got right. two over one. I got two better players than this one player playing in my head. We're done. And the reason why I love sports so much is because the, you have to show up. Yeah. You know, 
it don't matter what it says on paper. This team is better than this team. This person is faster, stronger, bigger than this person. We, you got to show up and prove it. Mm-hmm. And it's never easy. It's like there, you know, I think sometimes people think that when you're in a game, like it's just, you're not, you're not going to sweat. You're not going to fight for it. Like even the best team, if the best team is fighting against or playing against like a sucky team, they still got to work for that win. You know, yeah. there's going to be some downs. Like you might go down the scoreboard. You ultimately could win the blowout, mm-hmm. but life is like that. You know, um, you could set out a goal and things not look good in the first quarter or the second quarter. Yeah. <laughs> but we still got time. You make some adjustments, you know. That's the beautiful thing about sports is, you know, like I, I played baseball. And uh, if you're batting 300 on the year, you know, you're failing 70% of the time. But 300 is a good batting average. So, like, you have to have a short memory. So, I was going to ask you, so, like, before – your life completely changed. What kind of temperament did you have? Well, is it similar to now? Because you have an incredible temperament. Yeah. Like what you a missed tackle? What was your react? Like, you know what I mean? I'm kind of just curious. So i I'm a very fun loving guy. But I will tell you that prior to my accident, I wasn't as chill as I am. Mm-hmm. Uh, I grew up, I had anger issues growing up. Uh, life circumstances definitely like knocked off some of that mm-hmm. like anger stones off of me. Sure. Um but I think the hard thing was like so friend some friends that I had, friends that I still currently have that have watched me grow up are like, Mecca, your heart's always been the same. You know, you you've always had a heart for people. Um I think that I've just kind of learned a little bit more perspective. I know that I've gained a little way more perspective since my accident than um, I had prior, but I had a lot because I lived in Nigeria. Like sure. I tell you, that time that I lived in Nigeria really did something to my internal psyche because people think that my going there changed me. It wasn't going there to change me. It was coming back here that did because I realized there was the world was bigger than what I could see or what I experienced. Sure. And recognizing that um, kind of influences how I interact with the world. Um, and it just took me, after my injury, it just took me a, a little bit longer to recognize that because now being a person with a disability, I had a whole new perspective. Yeah. You know, there's a part, there's a side of life that I have never given thought to, that I have never, <sighs> just never really prepared for. You know, I, I think it's incredible that you went from a- academic probation to you have a master's degree. Like, how does that feel? Just for you personally, selfishly thinking. Like, not just forget the serving side of you that is so big, but, like, how, like I feel like people should hear that and be like, okay, I can go from, you know, sucking at school and failing classes and to, like, a master's degree. That's pretty wild to me, honestly. I'm so glad you asked that question because I'm going to be 1,000% honest. That... The night that I graduated with my with my master's degree, single handedly is the greatest mm. moment of my entire life, and I've had a lot of big moments. That is the greatest moment of my entire life because with my master's degree graduation, uh, it was such a culmination of so many different things. Mm. Um, it was me coming face to face with my fears of not being something. It was me, you know, seeing my mom and my dad, like actually have a, and my sisters actually have a reason to be proud of me. Um, It was seeing friends that had seen me in seasons past that did, you know, watch me grow. It was people that saw me after my accident that probably thought, Oh man, his life is over. Uh, Single handedly, the greatest moment of my entire life. Uh, and if anyone's out there watching that uh, is thinking about school, I, I think, look, let me tell you what my approach was was that I knew that I wanted to have my, like, a degree before 30. That was my mm-hmm. rallying cry. Like, I was 20, I think I was 26 when I went back to school, 25, 26 when I went back to school. And it was like, I am just going to get a degree before 30. And then I ended up with two of them for them. Wow. Um, yeah. And again, saying yes and showing up and 
just having people that believed in me when I didn't believe in myself really is what got me to this moment. So I, I, I'm someone that stands on the shoulders of giants because I don't want anyone thinking like, oh man, this is an incredible guy that like picked himself up by the bootstraps. Like I am not, I am a guy that fell on some hard times that lost belief in myself and was lucky to be surrounded by some people, some kids Mm -hmm. that planted seeds in me. You know, here I am showing up thinking that I'm giving them something and they were giving me something, something that I didn't know I needed um, until that fruit came. And I was like, wow, like, you know, here we are. Like, okay, life is unfolding before my very eyes. I'm like in awe, you know, I think about what you were kind of just saying and I'm like, you know, it's a perspective. Like, you literally look at it like, listen, my hopelessness is no different than anyone else's hopelessness. It just may look different, but it's not any different. It's the same feeling. It's the same place of mental anguish. It's the same place where you have to make a choice. Am I going to show up? Am I going to look at this head on and go, okay, let's play ball? You know, and I, that's, it's inspiring. It's admirable, but it shows anyone who's in that space like it's a choice it's a mental choice and put, put the people around you that can support you and if, even if there's no one you still got you i think that it's important for people to realize that again darkness is darkness you're you're like your former darkness and my former darkness is going to be different but um your my darkness is valid your darkness is valid your darkness yeah. is valid um and i do believe that hope is something that is generated that we can generate because again like i said goals pathways belief and when we are in that dark space all we have to do is analyze and figure out like yo what why am i in this dark spot it's not enough to just know that you feel pain you know where is this pain like doctors have to diagnose where do you feel tell me where you're hurting Mm -hmm. so i know how to diagnose and i know how to help you fix it for us we have to know where is the pain and is it because the goals that i've set are no longer there is it because there's something that I want that I don't feel like I have a way to get to it. Is it because there's something that I want, I have a way to get to it, but I just don't believe in myself. Uh, You know, what is the missing, what's the missing leak? Mm -hmm. And start to take small steps, small wins, small steps, get you big wins. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, I think whenever, again, going, showing up to youth group, uh, signing up for a class, uh, I now knew that after my ex, I now knew that my goals, what I thought was my goal, football being a goal, was actually a pathway. Uh, because my ultimate goal has always been I want to be a positive impact. You know, I want to have a positive life. I want to make sure I want to make sure that when I leave, someone and people are able to say, like, okay, this life mattered, you know? Yeah. Football was just a pathway to do that. I thought that it was a goal, but it was just a pathway. Yeah. And if you can create multiple goals and multiple pathways, you'll be okay. Because you know how they say when one door closes, another one opens up, you know? Mm-hmm. Sometimes there are multiple doors that are open. And because you went through one and one closes, we think that that was the only door. And it's like, no, take some time and really reflect. There, you know, life is full of opportunities. Mm-hmm. We just have to figure out, you know, which ones to step through and which ones that, you know, when they, and, you know, identify which other doors are open, you know? And yeah. so I think that is, you know, I think that is one of the hardest things that we go through as human beings is, like I said earlier, is that expectation that this is the door, this is the only door. And if I don't make it through this door, that's it. It's like, no, baby. Like, it's, it's this door. It's that door. Like, there's mm-hmm. there's a lot of doors. Just, yeah. you know, find it. Like, work to yeah. work to get it. Believe, you know. You were just focused on a certain door for a long certain, time. Yeah. And, that kind of singled out all these other doors. Sure. I honestly, I can tell you that I could be a lot of different things. Like sure. I know now how talented and multi hyphenated that I am. Mm-hmm. Like I, you know, me and Lori play chess, and I can't wait to I can't wait to to get her. But yes. <laughs> you know, knowing you know, there's just certain things I'm like, okay, you know, you, you play chess, you read books, um, you talk you dance you just enjoy yeah i'm a, yeah. I'm, I'm a i'm a very multi faceted faceted person mm-hmm. um how like how disappoint yeah i think 
I think sometimes about how um, how sad I would be if I felt like I was just one thing. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I'm, I'm a lot of different things. We're all a lot of different things, and I feel like you know, I, I could have been, I could have been a, a lot of different things. I could have been anything. But you being hyper focused on, I want to be a pro football player. Look at all yeah. the other things and opportunities, and the beauty yeah. that you shared with yeah. other people. That's in exactly what I'm getting. To. Yep. You would have. Sorry, I, no, I jumped in there. That, I'm the you. chess player. I was I'm trying five to say that's what, I, yeah, that's what I'm trying to get to. It's like you know, I could have done, I could do anything. Like I could do yeah. a lot of different things. So what made? Why would I? bottleneck myself down one lane yeah. you know um, and I think that when people are going through pain pain is that thing that makes you kind of go inside and like recluse you know mm-hmm. you you think that no one has ever experienced this pain before in my life and no one knows what I'm going through um, and that's just not the case I mean I there are books that I've read on like you know, Marcus Aurelius and just what people were going through and like that, you know, back in the day, ancient we we people have experienced loneliness, mm-hmm. um, you know, betrayal, adversity. You know, these are things that people it's the human condition. Yeah. Um, you're not alone in your experiences. Um, and I think that to me is one of the first steps in getting up, recognizing like, yo, I'm not alone. Um, and that's something I didn't mention earlier was that's what I think when I went to the center um, and being able to be around people that were experiencing life uh, some people better some people worse like and I say worse as far as like what I would consider their circumstances conditions Mm -hmm. but at the same time for better or for worse they enjoyed life Mm -hmm. They, they could show up with a smile on their face that to me was inspiring to let me know like yo Whatever it is that I'm going through, I can still show up. Um, mm-hmm. And but they, you know, as long as there's breath in my lungs, I I say yes to showing up. So I love that. Yeah. I don't think we have anything else to say on that note, um, Mecca. It has been an absolute pleasure. Tulsa, while you're out and about, if you see Mecca, he is so friendly. Just go up and introduce yourself. Say, say what's up. <laughs> <laughs> um, as always, thank you guys for tuning in, and I hope you guys yeah. have a great week. See ya.